So I want to thank everyone. I hope everyone had a wonderful break. Um, welcome back, and thank you again for joining us at the 2023 Connection Session. I'm thrilled to now introduce the culturally responsive panel. I'm sorry, the culturally responsive practices panel. This panel discussion will address strategies to recognize, respect, and be responsive of cultural values around seeking and receiving mental health services. So it really goes into a number of the questions that we had um, earlier today. We're gonna be joined by Anthony Beasley, Evita Johnson, Jonathan Edwards, Brandy Schultz, and we also had Jess Miller, uh, but they were unable to make it today because of this thing that keeps happening in our society. So following the 60 minute panel discussion, we're gonna hold 10 minutes for audience Q&A. So we're gonna now introduce each of our panel speakers. So first we're gonna start with Anthony Beasley. In 2018, Anthony Beasley successfully established and continues to operate a private practice that provides trauma-informed gender-affirming therapeutic services and resources to youth, adolescents, and young adults in Southeast Michigan. As a person who identifies as a queer transgender man of color, he has composed and presented educational material and part participated on multiple panels educating the medical and general community on the challenges and barriers to care that many in the LGBTQI plus community face. His main area of interest centers on how barriers and policies impact the lives of trans and non-binary individuals and may limit their access to medically necessary services and care. His future goals include teaching the next generation of social workers how to incorporate the equitable inclusion as they learn to provide services that are anti-racist, affirming, and ethically responsible to members within this community. His lived and professional experience as a trans person of color adds significant value to the uniqueness of what he brings to the field of social work and teaching others. Avita Johnson is a cisgendered, heterosexual, diaspora-descended woman educated in clinical mental health and behavioral health, traditional French culinary arts, and trauma-informed yoga therapy. She's a native Detroiter that is passionate about comprehensive individual wellness and community health. Jonathan Edwards is a licensed therapist, LMSW, specializing in adolescents and young adults. He works with clients to address anger, anxiety, depression, trauma, and issues related to gender and sexual identity. Jonathan sees clients at the, at the Corner Health Center, a nonprofit clinic in Ypsilanti, and as a member of Amplify Collectivo, a group therapy practice with locations in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. As a cartoonist, Jonathan's therapeutic practice is informed by the importance of creative expression, Jonathan earned a bachelor's degree in psychology from Morehouse College and a master's degree in social work from Howard University. Jonathan grew up in Washington, D.C. and currently lives in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Brandy Scholes has been dedicated to working within the mental health and social work fields for the past 17 years. She earned a bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in English from Xavier University of Louisiana and later obtained a master's degree from the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Brandy has experience assisting and advocating for others in multi-service, supporting housing, mental health, and early childhood education, comprehensive outpatient mental health, and juvenile justice-based prevention nonprofit settings in California and in Michigan. She currently provides individual and family psychotherapy services within a school-based health center program, supporting patients experiencing anxiety, depression, trauma, LGBTQIA2+, and disordered eating concerns. Brandy utilizes a holistic approach which emphasizes the significance of interconnectedness of one's mental health, physical health, and their environment. Evidence-based practices, including but not limited to cognitive behavior therapy and dialectical behavior therapy are utilized with an intentional, strengths-based and client-family-centered approach. Brandy is passionate about, uh, passionate about cultural humility, providing the foundation and dressing and meeting the very diverse barriers and needs of adolescents to further assist patients with making progress and gains towards the identified goals of treatment. Please, 
um, to join me in inviting these welcoming. We're gonna turn the back. I'm gonna run it back. Please join me in inviting these um, panelists and welcome them into our discussion today. I'm coming back. Um, we have some curated questions from the audience through the support of attendees. Um, these questions were submitted online, so thank you very much for people who did that. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to share a physical description of themselves for those who may not be able to see. So we're just going to start with you first, and we have some Um, I appear to be a black woman um, with a purplish shirt and a tie on the front and a blue skirt. Oh yes, Avita, <laughs> Avita Johnson, pronoun she, hers. Hi, my name is Anthony Beasley, pronouns are he, him. I am a mixed African-American. I'm currently wearing an orangish and brownish Congo hat. And I'm wearing a purple collared t-shirt uh, and I have glasses and I also have accessories such as a nose ring and earrings. Hello everyone, my name is Brandy Schultz. Pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a black woman who happens to be very tall. I'm about five, um, 10 and some change. I wear eyeglasses. I enjoy wearing my hair in natural hairstyles, like what I have currently, um, some knotless box braids. Um, I'm wearing a white shirt and a black sweater and a nice um, sunskirt to match the beautiful weather we're having today. I'm Jonathan Edwards, uh, he, him, his. Um, I'm a black man, short hair, glasses, beard, and uh, wearing a, a blue shirt. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for those physical descriptions. So we're going to get started with the questions. Um, both of those microphones you can use to answer those questions. Um, and I'm just going to post the question to all of you and you can decide what questions you're going to answer and which ones you would you know, want to sit out on if you'd like. So the first question we have is, from your experience, what gaps have you observed in adolescent mental health care that prevent young people from accessing supportive services? <laughs> I observe parents or family culture that does not encourage or support mm, open communication. Um, also, I observe colleagues who don't tend to their work or seeking out spaces to process maybe unconscious biases. Um, so I think what I observe the most often is there are white clinicians who want to do better, but don't have safe spaces to talk about some of the things they observe within their own family systems. Um, so they're also somewhat limited in their growth because there's a message of don't burden the people around you who are not white, but then you may not also have a safe space. So I think I see a gap of maybe a lack of initiative within the people who hold a white identity to create those spaces for themselves and their own colleagues. Um, it seems to be a need that isn't really addressed from what I can observe um, looking in. And I believe those things hinder or create like felt boundaries. And the adolescent is often looking for guidance, but if the person doesn't feel safe or open, then you know it's the work of the elders that are meant to guide them, I think the most. 
that's preventing it. All right, thank you. Does anyone else on the panel want to take an at that question? That was a great answer, but thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I'll add to it. Um, kind of like what the the uh, tac tac video showed a little while ago. Um, one of the gaps that I've seen or experienced is that um, we tell young people when they're experiencing some mental health struggles um, to talk to a therapist, but then it kind of ends there and there's not always um, an effort to demystify what that process even looks like. What does it mean to call a therapist? Do I have to pay for that? Um, where are the therapists? That kind of thing. Um, so to have people who can kind of explain what that process looks like, what therapy even is, what you can expect in your first session, um, those kind of things can help um, young people feel less uh, afraid of the process and, and less um, and more knowledgeable about it. And just to piggyback off the previous two responses, um, I am a clinical social worker at a school-based health center at a very local um, large high school, and there's one of me. So on any given day, there are 900 plus students roaming those halls who have various diverse, complex challenges and barriers and strengths, and I'm one person. And so I think that uh, a salient barrier is my wait list, you know, um, being able to uh, not serve the need that is ever so present on that campus where I am and trying to be very diligent and intentional when I do have to refer out and link patients and letting them know that, you know, please follow up and making sure that their parents and caregivers are following up. That way um, they're not continuing to try to make sense of all these things and figure things out on their own. Um, Another gap that I am very uh, mindful of is, you know, who I work for. I work for Michigan Medicine, you know, and we know that's a big uh, powerhouse and it has um, lots of you know, uh, connotations when you when you think of it and you see that big maze um, and when you walk through our health center, you know, and so um, providing people with um, a space to uh, acknowledge and identify um, those biases and kind of where they're coming from, I think is also um, very, very important as well. Okay, I'll just add a little bit. <laughs> um, a couple of things I was just thinking about <clears throat> would also, I think we were talking about this at lunch here too, is, is actually having access to some sort of healthcare um, that would allow them to access services? And if not, where can they access services on a pro bono or free basis? Because um, those are really, that's, that's really important. Um, and then I just totally forgot the second one. But the, the healthcare piece is, is a really big one. I think having access to that is, is super important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all your thoughtful responses. They were great. Our second question for you is, BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus youth are often hesitant to call crisis lines because they fear it will be awkward or that they will be take, talking to someone who doesn't have a shared identity. What alternative solutions would you give to young people on the edge of a crisis? I have an answer to that sort of, but also I remembered what the second thing I, that was for. <laughs> for lay, the, lay it on us, lay it on us. Um, and this kind of relates to this question, but it also, it, one of the biggest gaps I see is that there are not enough people of color <laughs> that our young people have access to in these therapeutic roles. Um, we were just talking about it at lunch. There's what, five, or as we may possibly, there may be seven black males working in therapy in Washington, in all of Washtenaw County. So there's a reason my email and my phone is overflowing often. And I'm just like Brandy was saying, we're one, one person in a setting and so many other folks out there needing these services. So um, there's that. But um, I, I, I think that some alternative solutions that I would try to present to um, my younger clients is, is trying to find 
Uh, well, the Ruth Ellis Center, first and foremost, is a, an, an absolutely wonderful resource for young people of color. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, do my field placement there as a student at the University of Michigan. So it was uh, uh, having access to, again, people who look like you, who, who walk and talk and maybe even dress like you or their hair looks the same as yours. That is something that I think um, is, is important. So having that shared identity, yes. What do we do for those folks when they're in crisis? Uh, honestly, I just, I, I give them my number and I give them any other person, ther therapist number that I know that is a person of color who is willing to, in a, in a moment of crisis, be able to help out. But that's the best answer I have right now. Uh, another point that sticks out for me is, um, I think for me personally, a large part of being a clinician is um, cultivating a space and uh, fostering, you know, that patients who I am lucky to serve are able to um, engage in certain tools and techniques and skill sets that we talk about in sessions outside of our, our work where the real work happens. And so my, my, my hope would be that, you know, if there was a crisis that did arise, we would have already done some really extensive safety planning that happens like, okay, if you are struggling and I'm not available and you don't feel safe and there's no trusted person who you could go to, we have to develop some other options. Like what, how could we implement a plan to keep you safe both emotionally and um, physically in that moment, should that arise? Um, you know, uh, maybe someone you could call or, or text uh, uh, an adult who is, is safe and, and trusted um, somewhere they could go um, to be safe, um, maybe some internal coping strategies or mechanisms, mechanisms that they could just tap into to, to keep themselves um, safe in that moment if they weren't feeling comfortable either going to the hospital or you know um, calling 988. Great, thank you so much, that was wonderful. I think we can go on to the next question. Those are both some really great answers. Thank you. Um, the next question we have for you is, what are some creative models for engaging youth in group mental health activities? Creative outlets usually bring people in. There's a lot of people doing work where they'll set up and organize painting a mural on the side of a building and I'll bring a community together and they'll begin to talk because they're having to work together. I don't, I kind of want to go back to the last question a little bit. Okay, go ahead. Because it feels, regardless of color, most people understand suffering. Um, and I think sometimes while our identities are important, it can create like a conceptual barrier that doesn't need to really be there. And maybe helping people use words that will connect across race and identities such as like my body hurts or just focusing on the, ex the lived experience of what they're going through versus maybe the circumstance or physicalities that contributed to the experience can help because regardless if it is primarily white folk you know doing this work and that's the resource there and they do know how to handle crisis maybe we can help people learn with yeah with experience versus focusing on the things that make people different and I think that that connects too with like what would make you excited to go out and maybe talk to strangers would it be free food right? Would it be being taught how to, to garden or something with somebody who lives down the street? And so thinking about what makes you excited or the things that makes you open up usually is, again, can go across stuff. So I, I, I don't know, that feels to be important about maybe not looking so much at the distinction. Like it is important, we need to recognize it. And there's opportunities, I think, if we take the time to look for them in each other. Absolutely, thank you so much. 
before we go into the next one, does anyone else want to give, give any comments or their thoughts? All right. Um, so we're going to go into the next question. I think Avita actually touched on this a little bit. Uh, but the next question is, what advice would you give to white providers looking to engage youth of color in a culturally responsive and community-centered way? What resources would be helpful for, for, for providers to increase their knowledge on cultural responsiveness? I did want to go back to the last question. Sorry, I forgot what it was in the moment, but I have a response oh, for it. Oh, yeah, no so, worries. Yeah, sorry. So um, I feel like when running groups, it's not even about... I think being creative is very important, but I think that what is really impactful is that it's very youth centric, um, that the the mission and the goals and the rules and um, what the group is trying to accomplish as a whole is um, identified and developed and kind of like formulated and implemented by the youth themselves and kind of what um, Avita um talked about earlier, you know, simple things like snacks, really get kids going, um, music, having art, like any expressive outlet to further um, just really illustrate that this space is hopefully very comfortable and very safe and um, people don't feel judged where we can get like the group juices flowing and try to accomplish what we're trying to do um, at the end of the day. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And if you ever go back to another question or like um, a previous question that we've already asked and you thought of something, then it's totally okay to respond to that too. It's really great. I don't have to respond to the last question. I'll stay on the, okay. the new one. I didn't think of anything for the other. Uh, well, mostly because I don't do a lot of group activities. So, um, but I think advice that I would give to white practitioners um, is just, just, just be aware. I mean, it's not hard to pick up a book. It's not hard to do a little research. You get, you know, you typically on your intake forms, get some information about where your client comes from, who they are, what they, what they may look like in a sense as the color of their skin or whatever, but you can, you can glean a lot from, from your intake forms. And so, um, so you may notice you have, uh, maybe you have a young student from, you know, I don't know, Kenya or something, some, some culture or country that is just not where you would think mental health is, is practiced on the daily. Um, you know, it's about understanding that again, like there are going to be cultures that where, you know, I, as a young person growing, I, I will divulge that I am of mixed race. I have a white mother and a, my father was black. Um, and, and that speaks a lot to my experience, right? So I was one half of my family was I was mental health. You should talk about it. Don't be sad. You can be sad, but talk about it. Da, da, da. But on my dad's side of the family, don't don't take that outside of the house. That's nobody's business, right? So these are things that are really, really important. And again, something that was brought up earlier, I think um, the Tac Tac video, somebody mentioned that, um, you know, you just, um, no, I, I said Tac Tac video and then I lost my thought. Ugh. Anyways, it's just, I think the most, the overarching thing here is that it, it's not gonna hurt to do research and learn more about where your client comes from. And the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to ask. Now, don't expect your client to school you on everything and educate you on all the finer points of, of their backgrounds and cultures, but do a little work yourself. I mean, I, even as a, a, a practitioner myself, I have to do the same thing. Uh, when I work with folks outside of my own, my own cultural identities and, um, things like that. So that's what I would share. <laughs> um, yeah, just to add to that, in terms of like, this is not effective. <laughs> I thought I was being smart. Okay. <laughs> um, what advice for white practitioners? Um, spend the money, um, like do the training, um, 
value it like it's any other educational pursuit. Um, don't expect to just kind of pick things up or figure it out or wing it. Um, I, I had a, a white colleague uh, years ago who um, I, I moved, so we're not in the same region, but had a, a black male client um, and was struggling to make a connection. And she paid my consultation rate and we sat for an hour and um, she asked me questions about, you know, related to cultural competency. Um, so, I mean, like things like that are, are helpful when, when I have clients, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm black, so, but it doesn't mean that I, I know <laughs> everything. Uh, so when I have clients that are outside of my cultural experience, I get the training. I'll pay somebody so that I can learn and expand my knowledge base and, and um, reach people. Um, I had another piece, but I think that's it. I was fortunate to work in a predominantly white um, counseling center for the first two years of my social work career. Um, and I also had a lot of, still do have a lot of white clients. Um, I had a school counselor as a client and she communicated that, um, I don't know if this is true, but this is what I was told and I've observed in some people that, um, Culturally, white people tend to consume uh, content and file it away as though they understand the material. However, it seems to be an opportunity for um, implementation. So for example, I had a lot of colleagues who had a racial training um, and um, we had a person come in for a sex training and she had a racial slur slip out. Nobody, in the room or on the call spoke up. And while all these people, and I was a first year social worker and I was one of the only people who said anything. We talked about it later. They didn't feel comfortable speaking up even though they knew what to do. And that seems to be a cultural thing um, within white clinicians and not addressing it or explicitly naming it makes it hard to correct. Um, another thing I would say, and this is a question I would like for people to write down, I've been asking clinicians who think they want to care for me, what have they been actively doing to address their racial biases? And if they do not have an answer, I do not let them support me. And I explain to them why. If you cannot answer that, if you cannot tell me what you're doing to invest, to make sure you don't cause me harm by blind spots, because I've watched my parents be treated poorly if I'm not in the room with them to ask the doctor, what is their, what is that? Opposing diagno uh, diagnostic, the di differential diagnostic. I learned that three years ago. That's scary to me. So these are things that I think it's hard, I think as a white person, because a lot of people aren't in a place to tell you explicitly what they're seeing due to perceived power dynamics. Um, but I do think that those two things are something that you can tangibly begin to question and work on yourselves. It's like, what am I doing actively? What would stop me from standing up for somebody I called my friend who was being racially or, you know, verbally accosted in front of me? What is it about me that would sit there and allow that? If you can answer those questions, honestly, and do the work to show up for who you think you want to be, a lot of your work will improve significantly. Um, so I think that those, those things, not just reading, but maybe creating groups where you can talk about, okay, but what did you do this week to implement what we read last week? And then another, what am I doing at home? What am I doing when there's no brown people around and maybe my cousin says something racist or derogatory towards people who are disabled or whatever? These, these are the things that matter. Um, holding your people accountable when nobody's in the room. I think, yes, that's enough. <laughs> No, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I also want to provide some thoughts. And like I said, if you want to go back and answer a previous question or you thought about something from this next question um, and you want to answer it, that's totally okay. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question, but I want to say thank you again to Avita. I think it's really important that um, we recognize that when we're trying to better ourselves for the benefit of others, that, that can be nice, but you really want to do that kind of work for yourself. 
Um, and I think you touching on that point was really, really important that um, we wanna be culturally responsive because we wanna be good people in our culture, not just because we wanna help people who don't look like us, right? So thank you so much for that. Our next question for you is, how can providers assist youth, specifically BIPOC youth, in shifting the cultural narrative that's seeking uh, about seeking mental health services? So mainly like, how can, how can y'all help youth um, deal with that stigma of like mental health services and like, with that, how that shows up. I I show them by talking about, hey, I go to therapy too, and it's good. Um, that's one of the things I think that even like when I have students that come into my office is that the I feel like the best way that we can show these things is by is like leading by example, basically, and showing, you know, hey, like sometimes I'm talking to my client in a therapy session and we're working on something and I'll be like, oh, hey, you know, this is something that I'm actively trying to work on right now. Um, but also just talking positively about mental health. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate, I mean, I'm like a total sports junkie. So I've been really appreciating like the NFL, the WNBA, the NBA and stuff like really making a point to talk about mental health and talking about how important it is. Um, because it isn't just about our depression and our anxieties or any of the other diagnoses that, you know, come with having mental health illness or challenges. Um, but it's, it's important to, I guess the, the word would be is to, to normalize it is because these are things that a majority of us experience. And the one thing that I really do appreciate, I remember the tac tac thing, um, you know, like talking a lot about, you know, we as adults in this room, once we're teenagers, once we're screaming babies on planes, you know, things like that. Um, and, and I think that we do because of our everyday hustle and bustle and we're just trying to survive that we forget about that. And we tend to forget that our teens and our young people like when are going through the same things that we did, but on a grander scale, because I think her personally, social media is, you know, it just puts it there in front of their faces. So, um, but again, I just would like stress to them how normal this is. It doesn't make them a bad person. It doesn't make them a damaged person that actually it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to, to face some of the things that we actually have to face in our lives. So that's what I would Uh, yeah, the um, the stigma that the young people are experiencing. Um, I guess the first thing that I would do, or one of the first things, is uh, normalize that um, and to acknowledge like where it comes from. Um, maybe even like acknowledge it as a strength. Um, that stigma about not seeking help um, or neglecting mental health, it comes from somewhere. Uh, it comes from maybe personal experience or, you know, cultural experience, like collective cultural experience. So like those things happen. So to be a student of history, um, you know, mental health history helps me uh, to know like, oh, these are things that were done in the name of mental health uh, to groups of people. Uh, and there are consequences for that. Um, so me just going into the community with my hand out, like, you know, don't you want some help um, can ring hollow if I I'm ignorant of those experiences. Um, individual experiences also, you know, you talk to a therapist and then they tell your parents what you said, like that that results in a reluctance to seek help in the future and acknowledging that that happened um, and not treating it like a weakness on the client's part. Like, why won't you accept this help? Why won't you talk? Um, I, I think that's just a, a better perspective to have. I know for me um, professionally um, with the school-based health model where I am currently employed, I am lucky enough to be on a campus to where we have a school-based health center at one of the four elementary schools 
at the middle school and then myself at the high school. And so we literally follow a young person if they so choose all the way from kindergarten up until their age 22 with not only their physical and emotional, but their mental health um, wants and needs as well. So with that being said, I think that we are truly, really trying to um, address that stigma head on and teaching young people and families very, very early on just the necessity of, of mental health and being kind and gentle and caring for ourselves and others. And also um, trying to speak up if you're able to, to reach out for support um, something else has also been helpful for me is um, even though I'm housed in a high school, we are in like a, a health center. It looks like a doctor's office. And so we're kind of tucked away. And so we have to get out there and kind of get our face out there. Like we're not just some names, like we're real people here to serve you. That's literally what we're placed here for. And so every Tuesday and Thursday, we go into classrooms and we do outreach, you know, um, we introduce ourselves, we do a little PowerPoint spiel, we have postcards, we have consents, we bring swag, um, just trying to get uh, our name further out there, but letting people know, like, we're not just this big M. This is me. This is our nurse. This is our doctor. This is our dietitian. Please, if you or a peer or a partner is hurting or struggling, please come see us. Like we were here right down the hall. And that's really important. And then my last point is with the patient's consent and blessings, obviously, um, I think bringing in the family is a huge part of that. Um, addressing once again, those biases and that stigma and that culture of, of certain folks not feeling safe and, and comfortable um, reaching out for support and trying to um, slow down that, that cycle of not seeking professional help and also slowing down that cycle of um, transgenerational um, trauma and other cycles, like getting families and parents, caregivers, trusted people involved. That way that young person has that support group and that network um, when they need it most. Um. I recently saw um, a study guide and I'll try to get the resources. Um, there was a little short blurb about how to be culturally responsive to different um, identities. And I saw that African-American communities prefer for a clinician to self-divulge. I wish I had been told that in school because I was told to do that was basically sacrilegious and base would destroy everything. Um, so learning about the person you're serving in terms of that, like, Self-divulging is one of the few ways I know to earn trust with a client. But if you had no idea about that, how could you support or encourage somebody you're serving? So just like somebody said, educate yourself. Um, my personal, well, my professional approach is that anxiety is, and depression are both trying to communicate. Most physical symptoms are, sensations are trying to communicate that either you don't feel comfortable or something is out of alignment with you. So if we can normalize that it's a physical, like a physiological response that does not reflect brokenness, it reflects that something needs to be addressed and looked at, that can help remove a lot of, I think, cognitive barriers from adolescents, regardless of the messaging they're getting from their environment. Um, and I think that does also relate to the self-divulging too of, you know, I experienced some nervousness today when I was getting ready to think about coming to talk to a whole bunch of strangers. It was a physiological response and I was able to tell myself, hey, why don't we just get there today and see how we feel? We can run away if we really want to, right? So doing that and being able to use experiences throughout the day to say it's super normal, it's a part of being human, um, I think can help people really just learn how to manage what seems to be a normal part of humanness. All right, thank you all so much. Those are really great um, responses and thoughtful answers. We're gonna move into the Q&A section, so like open Q&A, so people in the audience here or in the chat online, um, you can submit a question um, in the feature located on the right of your screen. So does anyone in the audience or online in the chat have a question that they wanna ask our wonderful panelists who did such a great job so far? So hi, my name is Hallie Williams. My pronoun are she, her. Um, I have a question about when building trust to have an adolescent come to you, but you're starting to see like outbursts and aggression, 
how do you make sure there's space to say like, hey, we have the resources to help, but if they don't take it, what are the steps to kind of like help mitigate it in a session that doesn't make it toxic for the surrounding parties? If in my experience, if an adolescent, as a young person is expressing big emotions is because they feel safe. So trying not to re react, but more so reflect what I'm observing. So maybe they can see how their experience is affecting the world around them and the people around them. Um, I really try to teach yoga poses because they can help the body physiologically, even if the person cannot think logically in the moment. And so a lot of times I'll keep a bolster in my room, which is a little pad to help somebody relax a bit and teach them breathing exercises so they don't have to think too hard or remember too hard, but they know they can put their legs up a wall if they feel angry. So giving them like something tangible, you can use a pillow, you can go stand outside barefoot because that will physically, like physiologically ground you and you don't have to work so hard to dispel that energy. Um, a lot of times when the outburst is happening, it's because their home life isn't safe enough for them to process it. So being non-reactionary helps normalize that their outburst is probably something that needed to happen instead of shaming them. So they can begin to be curious about it, hopefully reduce the outburst. Um, and then trying to just give them simple things that they can remember at home without needing to explain it so much, I guess. So much. I see we have another question in the back here. Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> mm. Thank you, um, Dana Thomas. She, her pronouns. I'm interested in coming from a parent's perspective. Um, what can parents do or other adults um, who are in young people's lives, what can they do to be that askable adult? Um, to share or to the space that's saying that I need help? What can parents do or adults do um, to create that space for young people who are in their lives? And I, I do have a second question, but I'll see if others have. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a parent. I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, I would say one of the things that parents can do um, would be to listen first um, as opposed to speaking first and to confront probably through therapy uh, the barriers, the internal barriers to um, being okay with what your kid tells you. So um, yeah, it's hard, me as a parent, it's hard to see like what my kids are going through and not see that, uh, not center myself and say, what does this say about me as a parent? You know, but that thought can't hijack the real priority, which is, you know, my child's well-being. So um, I would say, listen first, uh, think more about um, centering your child's experiences, the young person's experience, and then getting help yourself, maybe even modeling that uh, for the young person and say, you know, it, it impacts me to hear you say that you're going through depression and anxiety. I'm thinking about my own history with depression, and anxiety and our family history and what I saw with, with your grandparents and all that kind of stuff. So I need to address that within myself as I'm guiding you towards getting uh, your help as an individual. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> I'm not a parent, but I would, that, that would be like the, the avenue that I would, would take my parents down is, you know, because I think about like my personal experience growing up with my mother and, and honestly, had I not seen her vulnerability, her modeling the importance of taking care of her mental health, her saying to us, I'm sorry, I need to take care of myself. I need to put myself in a hospital. So to, to watch your parent do that, I think is, is a great example of knowing that no matter what the problem is, there can be a way to solve it, but what are the ways that we can do it? But like I said, my dad would have never modeled that kind of behavior, but having my mother model it for me was, was something that really, really, truly helped. 
she listened, just like Jonathan said, you know, she really listened and tried to be as present as possible, considering, you know, what parents go through on a daily basis. And let's be real, I was not the easiest child. Okay. But that's what I was. So much for some awesome responses. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Just oh. one quick question, just to kind of piggyback off of your question. There was a movie on Netflix. I can't remember the name of it. I, I think it's called He or Him, Where the Sun um, was Suicidal. And he told the therapist he, he no longer wanted to be in treatment. And the uh, therapist recommended that he not be released from treatment. But the son begged his parents to remove him from treatment. And they removed him and then he committed suicide. What advice do you have for parents when they're on that fine line between 